slide on the left, or the graph on the left, pardon me, shows that the general population, only a minority are smokers. In a population of those with a history of depression, a propensity for, or current depression, a majority are smokers. Uh, and, you know, if you were using the Presbyterian approach, um, you would say, well, this is because these people have so much time on their hands, perhaps they don't have the requisite skills to get their ducks in a row the way that other people might have, and it's the only pleasure that remains, and we should, you know, and blah, 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 which is, uh, again, I, I think a, a, an inappropriate perspective. When we begin thinking like clinicians and scientists and seek to deconstruct this relationship and identify if there are contributing mechanisms, we begin to find some interesting facts. If you look at the slide, or pardon me, the scan on the left, which is that of a non-smoker, you see that something is lighting up the kidneys, the liver, the heart, and the brains of those who are non-smokers. Something is absent in those same structures in smokers, and that something is monoamine oxidase. And most clinicians are completely unaware that hundreds of times a day, smokers are self-administering small doses of monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And so as a consequence, they are self-medicating, if you will, and deriving some benefit in terms of their depressive symptoms as a result of this phenomenon. Conversely, when individuals <coughs> stop smoking, when certain individuals stop smoking, it's quite reasonable to suspect or predict that symptoms of depression might emerge. And typically, when those symptoms do emerge, the emergence of those symptoms has been attributed to the agent that has been used to help people stop smoking. Clinicians all across this country know about the relationship between grapefruit juice and the metabolism of statins. Notwithstanding, I've got to drink tanker loads of, well, not quite that much. But most clinicians, most family physicians, have no idea about some of these fundamental relationships. Why should, we, why should they have to know about this? This is a habit. And if their patients were just better organized, they would do something about it. And so we've not felt any kind of investigative or scientific responsibility in trying to, to understand some of these kinds of processes.